show i think i got things backwards on my timing list there but hope y'all are doing well it was a, uh, a great trading session out there some great movements to the south side i'm bummed i didn't keep my iwm but uh, russell futures is what it is i have some trade updates for things that i've done in my accounts which i will let you know about but i'm going to start things off with the news of the day which is this man right here mr elon musk tesla's big miss now it, the way it's written there it almost sounds like they had an earnings miss but it was not an earnings announcement it was just a delivery update on their numbers and you know, a lot of pressure has been put on Tesla to meet all these deadlines. They said they were going to come out with a certain amount of vehicles, and they just uh, th they missed that number, and they've missed it pretty bad. And of course, we can go into all the different reasons as to why, but let me bring up the, the chart of TSLA here. Uh, they built 433,000 vehicles. They delivered 387,000, which is a miss of about 46,000 vehicles. And I guess the, the piece that has Wall Street concerned is, those numbers have been declining quarter over quarter. So we're seeing, you know, kind of a, a drawdown in the amount of vehicles that are being not only delivered, but are also being produced. And there are several different reasons that Elon Musk, or excuse me, Tesla, uh, pointed out to number one being increased competition, which we've talked about in the past on my EV shows I've done here. So of course we know more competition coming into the space. That's a, no surprise. Number two was the price cutting. Because of all that competition, they're now dropping their prices. But again, that not, doesn't necessarily impact the, the delivery side of things. That leads us to the other variables, which were um, you had an arson, some arson shut down the German factory. You had deliveries from the China factories were delayed because they had to reroute some of the shipping vessels due to uh, the Red Sea and things like that. Um, and then you had a ramping up of the new Model 3. So about time they didn't upgrade to that. So, of course, there's going to be some changes here, a little bit of growing pains, if you will. Uh, Got to update those vehicles every now and again. And, of course, just global events impacting their bottom line. Now, what does that mean for you and I? Well, we talked about this the other day. I am a, a long-term bullish on Tesla. And it's just a matter of when's that buy point. So based off of that, uh, I took a pretty aggressive trade for the next three days. And we will see... Uh, hey, less happy Taco Tuesday out there. You know, it's funny. I live out here in Southern California. I think I get to witness more rocket launches than you do down in Cape Canaveral. Uh, I got to witch witness the Starlink um, satellite launch yesterday. Great. It's so cool. So fun to watch. Literally stood on the roof of my house and just watched this pretty much right over the roof of my house. It was very, very cool. Um, and I also tweeted out, you know, I find it fascinating that for years, if you wanted to watch a rocket launch, you know, Cape Canaveral was kind of the place to go. And they just told you the time and you could sit back and grab your binoculars and check it out. When Tesla and SpaceX, or when SpaceX does their launches, it's pretty amazing because they have a full-on broadcasting crew that is literally doing play-by-play. -play. Okay, we've turned on the auxiliary booster engines and here and now is the cool down phase. And they go through the countdown, the launch. They show you from the rocket ship as it's going through space and kind of the parts falling off and relanding on barges. It's pretty cool. If you haven't... Um, I had a chance to watch on those. I'll let you know when the next one is out here in California from Vandenberg Air Force Base. I usually try to watch those when I can, and they're becoming more and more popular at the beaches, etc. Uh, but I'll post on my Instagram or my Twitter feed uh, when those launches are going to happen, and then you guys can log into the SpaceX YouTube channel, which has a great broadcast out there. Uh, do I have a taco tracker? No, I don't. Uh, let's see. Anders, uh, do we have to get Tesla out of... Mag 7, uh, mm, interesting question. Well, let's see what that one, uh, just got back to back. Uh, let's says we had two launches from Cape, the Cape on Sunday, but did you get to go into the whole control panel and watch all of it? Uh, maybe I, I just don't know what's going on over Cape Canaveral. No, I apparently you can't see the solar eclipse out here on the West Coast. It's funny, there's a map which just has like a streak across the middle of America, almost like the diver symbol. And that's the only spot you can see it. Every other place is nope, you won't get to see it. Um, oh, cool. you're, you're, you're probably about as close as I am then, Les. You might be actually closer. I just get to see the tail end of that plane flying over. Okay, so let, what does this mean for Tesla? I like Andre's comment. Do we have to get Tesla out of the Magnificent 7? I do not think so. I think Tesla is pretty much here to stay. Um, I think that once we go, you know, Tesla has established itself as a vehicle company, as Tom pointed out many times, you know, it was overvalued. And that typically happens when stocks are in their extreme growth phase. Like NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA, I would argue, maybe not as overvalued as Tesla was during its peak. 
uh, but it certainly has a higher P.E. ratio because people are expecting those future earnings of NVIDIA to be so great. And that was the case for Tesla as well. Um, I was not very bullish on it back in, uh, you know, go back to 2015, 16, 17. I was not very bullish on Tesla at all. They had just way too much debt, but they came out of it. And that's a recurring theme that you're going to hear throughout today's show is, you know, these companies take on a massive amount of debt to get the facilities up and running and tooling all the machinery, et cetera, and then finally getting the production lines going. Can they, can they turn that corner? That's the big question. Tesla obviously has done it. Rivian seems like it has done it. We'll see if that is in fact true when we get their earnings here in a few weeks. Um, but all in all, does Tesla need to be removed? I, I don't think so. I think it's going to actually turn in more from a vehicle company to a information site because people, I think, will be licensing Tesla's vehicular AI, and then they'll start to go into the robotic side, which just is pretty exciting for me. So all of that said... Uh, I took a pretty aggressive play today, and I sold puts on Tesla at the 160 strike price. Let me move this line down. We talked about that with Don on um, Friday's show, that 162.50 is kind of a decent spot. Why do the 160s? Now, I could have gotten more premium for the 162.50s, obviously, but I sold the 160s. Uh, those will be expiring on Friday. So I, what I've done is I... I you know, you've got really bad news and people talking negatively about Tesla right now, which typically for me represents a time to buy. I'm using the low price here that you see on Tesla that goes back to March 14th. That low price was 160.51. That's uh, and then the next day, Friday the 15th, you had a low price of 160.76. So I'm using 160 as a backstop. I would like to own Tesla, uh, but I went really only out a couple days here, just going out three days really for... Um, Big t premium on TGSC. Premium wasn't that great on, on Tesla today. What I did get, um, I got 90 cents. So I collected 90 cents worth of premium on that Tesla, but that's for three days. So 90 cents on $160 stock, you're talking about 0.6% about rate of return for three days. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, definitely a little bit aggressive because I, I am catching that falling knife, right? It's that that aggressive sell-off uh, that, that's driven off of fear, the, the realization they've missed their numbers and it's not looking so good on Tesla, but I do think that that represents opportunity. I'll let you know what happens by Friday. You know, if it closes below 160, I'll, I'll look at what I want to do there, whether that's to sell some calls against it to offset that or if I just close out. Because if you notice, once we get below that 160 mark, it has some room to fall. Really, your next stopping point's right around 153. And then after that, you've got to go to lows that we haven't seen for quite some time going back into these 2023 lows. I say quite some time, over a year ago. All right, so that's the, the Tesla. I did five of the 160 puts sold today, collected 90 cents worth of premium. That was near the end of the trading session. So uh, I, I, I molded over as I was watching how, how beaten up it was. You can see the price chart here intraday. Um, I kind of wish I would have sold those puts earlier on because it was down below 162 at one point today. Uh, when I sold my puts, it was right around the 165, 166, somewhere in there. So all in all, uh, I'm okay with that, but it's a risky play. We'll see how it pans out. Only, um, what was that, 90 cents times five, so you got $450 on, on that one. So not, not or 5,400, not too bad. 54, $540. Jeez, get my math right today, Merlin. Okay, so uh, I did try, I've tried to get my visuals going over here. So the first uh, entry on my little ESPN ticker, which I'm going to work on the colors and try to make it better, but I have to spend time to do this one every day. It's kind of annoying. There, uh, I'll just talk about number two point on my watch list for today, which was the Fed uncertainty. So what you got today was several members of the FOMC sounding a lot more confused. You had Bowman, Williams, Mester, and Daly were speaking today. And remember last year, you had the market pricing in eight rate cuts this year. You had the Fed pricing in six. That was what their target was. Now those three of those members kind of sounding a little bit confused. And they're saying three rate cuts by the end of the year. All right. So I'm going to put that into perspective. That's a 50% decline in what the Fed was expecting. They thought they were going to do six cuts this year. Now they're thinking three. Now I say they, those three members. That does not represent the collective board for the FOMC. But let me bring up the, the forecast here so we can kind of see what the end of year prognosis is for the market, right? 
<clears throat> so the Fed is saying three. What's the market say? That's always a nice uh, separation of, of ideology from those two perspectives. Let's go to December, 20, December 18th, 2024. Right now, we're at five and a quarter to five and a half. The market, if you look at this right now, has priced in three rate cuts. So now it's actually in line with what the rate cuts were. Yeah, uh, Dave, if I, had, if I could do it without stalling and making an annoyance on the show by waiting, I would do a poll right now. <clears throat> um, maybe I'll, I'll set one up for tomorrow so I can do it before the show. But you can see a pretty wide swath of, of expectations. It goes from 3.75 all the way to staying exactly where we are at. My guess is uh, we'll probably see two rate cuts if we see a rate cut, if rate cuts at all. I'm really in the camp of, and you, you know my, my thinking, is that we're starting to see inflation tick back up, tick back up, tick back up. And not that it's going to surge aggressively, but I believe that those numbers we've been quoted by the Fed and FOMC are not as, as solid as they sound. Now, what's my basis for that? Well, take a peek at crude oil, which is one of our talking points for yesterday. Here is the crude oil chart. You know, we have been drifting higher and higher the last uh, three days. Just the last three days alone have been fantastic for anybody holding long crude oil. You're looking at five, almost 5% 5 gain in three days for crude oil. Pretty, pretty robust gains. And that's continuing on off these lows that we saw back here on December 13th. So in just a series of a few months, crude oil has jumped 25, almost 26%. That absolutely is going to impact us at the pump. That's cost of goods uh, increasing, and that's just one element of it. So um, I am definitely in line with the Fed here, who kind of sounds a little confused a bit. Maybe we don't know how many rate cuts we're going to do. And you know what? It may actually be a, uh, a year that we don't get any. Now, let me ask you this, and there is no right answer here. It's, it's prognostication time, hypothesis time. Let's assume that the economic conditions don't necessi necessarily deteriorate significantly, but we see inflation continue to trend higher for the next, let's say, five, six months. Now, obviously, we know there's going to be some government manipulation as we go into an election year. What data gets manipulated, I don't know, but I'm certain there will be some of it. So, if we see crude oil trending higher, let's say through heck, through the end of the year without any significant pullbacks, that would most likely mean that the Fed will not cut this year. What, what do you guys think will happen if they don't cut this year? Remember, that would be a shock to the system. That'd be a surprise, right? They're expecting right now, the Fed member said three cuts this year. What do you think would happen to the markets? And the only reason I'm asking you to think out, think this way is because if we find ourselves in that situation, it's good to have a game plan. Okay, here's my approach going towards that if the ducks do in fact line up and we do not see rate cuts as anticipated this year. Remember, it was eight, six, three. That number's dropping real quick and the main contender that's driving that is inflation and there's your crude oil. Now, of course, we can go back to uh, the core PCE price index last week, which was in line with expectations. We got another couple weeks here till we get our CPI and PPI numbers, but what do you guys think the impact would be? How would you play that? No, if you're if you were thinking today that you know what, there's gonna be no rate cuts the rest of the year and inflation is gonna continue. How do you position yourself in that one? Let's see. Les says, is there really a need for rate cuts if the economy looks so strong? That that kind of is my argument as well, Les, is I don't the economy feels like it's trucking along right now. Why do we need to upset the motion? Right? You've got markets ripping to all-time highs. The Fed's unwinding its balance sheet, and it's not impacting the market as significantly. We're not seeing the long-term yields spike aggressively, right? which was the concern early on, certainly one of my concerns. Um, I, I, I personally don't think the Fed should cut at all. We should just stay right where we're at if in, and, and keep it dependent on inflation. Right? If inflation starts to, to rear its ugly head, obviously you, you don't cut rates, and, and that's where I'm hanging my hat on now for the remainder of the year, at least for the foreseeable future, as I see increases in those prices. Which data will be manipulated so they can cut? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't think the Fed needs to cut. And and why? Bob, you know, when you're raising, cutting, raising, cutting, raising, cutting, you you create problems. So keep it constant for a while so you can see the long-term impacts of all those historic rate cuts that they have done. The prudent thing to do now is just hold, hold, hold. The market is going to drive this, right? The market is pressuring 
Jerome Powell and the Fed to cut. You, you saw Elizabeth Warren and a couple other senators literally write demand letters to the Federal Reserve, who needs to make their own decisions here, but demanding that they cut rates because it's hurting unemployment. You know, we're starting to see more job loss. Well, that's not true. Look at the economic calendar for today. I didn't put this as one of my line items, but Jolt's job openings were in line with expectations. You got 8.76 million jobs available. Everything's looking pretty good. If you look around the world, manufacturing data for almost every country is improving. That doesn't mean it's in positive territory, but it's improving pretty much everywhere. I'll start at the top of the list here. Let's go to uh, Spanish manufacturing numbers. Better than expected, although a slight step down from the previous month. Okay, not bad. Uh, Swiss franc, what do they make? Chocolates? All right. Swiss franc was better than expected. Italian manufacturing was better than expected, but just crossing over that uh, 50% line. France! Well, you know the French, they like to work over there, they make some bread and stuff. We have uh, the French looking good. They increased, although still below 50. Germany is kind of dismal here, 41.9%. So it was a, it was better than expected, but still showing a you know negativity or pessimism with regards to manufacturing in Germany. And you had a similar picture for the uh, final manufacturing PMI for the European Union as a whole. And the UK, just like the United States, popped into positive territory. So um, all in all, manufacturing numbers starting to look pretty darn good out there. So, yeah, uh, obviously governments from each of those countries would like their manufacturing numbers better, but that, that's it. Margaret says uh, Elizabeth Warren needs to lose her job. Yeah, you know, she's, she's trying to make a name for herself. She's trying to be visible, and I can understand, but I think she just kind of loses sight of the fact that we are in the, one of the most employed markets that we've seen in a long time. There's plenty of jobs. It's, it, these rate cuts aren't hurting the market from an unemployment perspective. It's like, oh no, we ticked up to 3.9. Pull up the historical chart, that's lower than historical norm. So yeah, she. I think it's just about being educated. <laughs> I know, Rob, I don't know. I, I just went off on France there for a second. Who knows? It's, it's just my, my giddy day, that's all it is. All right, let me see what you guys think about what to do if we in fact do see that type of environment of rising inflation and the Fed backpedaling and saying, hey, we're going to hold the rest of the year. What do you guys say? Uh, markets will be prepared for a delayed crut, uh, delayed rate cut. I think they're working on that one. Um, VB met so strategic, strategic oil reserves will be depleted. Yeah, I haven't looked at the data on how full our strategic oil reserves are, but I don't think it's a very good looking picture at this point. Um, you know, the, the price of oil increasing certainly would put pressure on them to open up our reserves to drop the oil prices down. But with the points I made yesterday about OPEC plus and Mexico curtailing output, you know, that does drive prices up. If you have you have issues with Russia's pipelines as well, you know, any kind of supply chain disruption can cause a surge up in crude oil. And that's such a dependent factor for so many goods and services, let alone transportation. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's a very real possibility. Uh, metals will continue to rise. You know, and I was mentioning that the other day, Sly Dog is, you know, we look at this market that feels robust, the markets keep trending up, and my attitude has been, go with the trend, trend is your friend, to the bend at the end, stay long, even though I find this hard to believe that it's going up like this. I did also point out that I'm really looking at gold and silver as that hedge, and to me, that historical flight to security, check out GLD today, I mean, this is a pretty clear, you know, they say the markets talk to you. Trust the charts. Listen to the charts. Well, this is telling you something right here. It's telling you that people are demanding gold. And, well, why would you demand gold? Because it's a physical, tangible asset that they can't, well, I guess they could take it away from you as they did uh, back in the 70s. But it's it's that flight to security. It's an inflation hedge. And inflation appears, at least for now, the data's not showing it, but technically you look at the charts that drive inflation, inflation's going up. So I think that this is that that hedge, and you know if we do see inflation, I think Sly is right. Metals will continue, which is why I'm I'm long gold and silver. I'm a little irritated that silver ripped this much. I mean, silver was up 4.29 percent today. Remember, I sold the 2350 calls against my remaining um, 8,000 shares of SLV. So I don't want to see it rip this much, but I'm fine with it. I mean, I'll have a substantial gain in that account, so that's okay. Um, but you're right, Sly. I do think metals will continue. You know, we'll see, and, and not just metals, but commodity prices in general will probably continue to move on to the upside. Uh, what else do we have here? Unemployment rises slightly. Spy slowly trends down the rest of the year, and politicians blame everyone else. They'll certainly blame whatever parties in the in the current administration. Let me bring up that unemployment data just so we can check that out here. Uh, I don't, let me. It's going to take me a second to um, 
run a filter here so I can bring up just the US markets. But I'll do this on Forex Factor so you guys can see kind of what I'm doing. I'm gonna remove um, all countries except the US and that'll get me an easier reference here. Uh, unemployment is always on a Friday and it is this Friday. So 3.9%, but check out the historical levels. Um, you know, back when we were robust in 2018, right? We were at 3.7, we're at 3.9 today, big deal. If you look back at the peak that we had during the financial crisis, we were up around, uh, let me get that, about 10, right? With 10% unemployment. And we brought that all the way back down. Before, if you look at 2007 and eight, when the markets were ripping to the upside, we were back to all time highs that we hadn't seen since 2000 on the S&P and the NASDAQ. That's back in 2006. We we're at 4.4%. So, you know, historically we are very low. So to, to say that this is destroying jobs and lives because the rates are, you know, it's hurting unemployment, that, that's just wrong. That's an uneducated, uninformed politician right there. So congratulations, Elizabeth Warren. Another thing you're not very clear on, but you gotta make a voice for yourself crying out saying that you're going to defend your constituents. So sad part is, I think Elizabeth Warren's going to get voted out of office in her next in a re-election campaign. So bring it on. All right, Lee says, I think people get angry, but will continue to spend money they don't have. And I guess I will continue to pay attention to energy stocks. <laughs> well, you know, my hope is that most people will realize that they got to stop spending money on things they just absolutely don't need and, and bring it back to what you really need. And that will change this, this market discourse. Now remember, let's just say in, in a perfect Merlin world, all right, you guys know I would love to have my own company where I do my own education and I'd love to do it from a, a Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman approach, which is about personal finance. If we had a collective movement in the United States that said, okay, let's bring all Americans together. I got to watch this you know, three video series on how to grow their wealth and maintain uh, and, and just save their money through spending habits and good things like that. If we can get just a small fraction of Americans to think like that, like, wow, I don't need to be buying all this crap and being pressured to buy new cars and all these interest payments and things I just really don't need. If I stop spending, then that enhances my personal financial situation. The inverse of that, or just the tangent, the, the, the accompaniment that goes with that would be that if everyone all of a sudden started really monitoring their expenses and not going out to eat at restaurants all the time, not buying a new car every couple of years, and really just locking down their numbers, our economy would probably take a pretty big hit, right? So it's that fine balance. You know, you kind of don't want everybody to be smart with their money, but we really should all be smart with our money and not spend. Because at some point, if this does continue the way that it looks like it's going with inflation getting higher, markets will take a bit of a dip here. And that could present some great buying opportunities for you and I going forward. Key is you got to have capital when those moments happen. So it'll be an interesting, interesting time for sure. Uh, let me see. I got a whole bunch of other stuff here. Liz says, dollar will remain strong. Equities will fall, enter some bearish positions. Yep. And let's take a peek at that dollar, for example. I was planning on doing a short show today, but that seemed to not work. Um, here is the Dixie, the dollar index, which was slightly down today. But remember, the Fed is retiring money. It's taking money out of circulation. And while that's not going to have a huge impact immediately, slowly, this should continue on up. And I don't think it's unrealistic to think that, you know, 106 would be on the plate by the end of the year. I, I definitely don't think that's unrealistic. Now, what would that mean? Well, from current levels, if we got to 106, you're looking at a just a 2% just a increase in the value of the dollar against that basket of global currencies. That may not seem like a lot, but that will have an impact on our markets. You know, that means people can buy less American goods and services. Uh, what else do I have here? Joe says employment is still very strong. Very strong, Joe. It's silly to think that, you know, people are talking about how bad unemployment is. It's not even close. Uh, it's threatening their grasp on power for sure. Um, I'm itching to dump my silver dead money for too long. Yeah, man, but... See, here's the thing. You finally got it moving, Larry. It's finally moving in your favor. You're finally getting that big boost. You're like, oh, I'm going to sell it, right? Maybe you sell a portion of it and keep the second half. Um, I personally don't want to sell my silver. I think SLB is going to continue on up here, but I didn't think it would be this fast. That's why I sold those 2350s. I got less premium than I wanted on my call options against my position. But, uh, you know, I thought we'd end up on April uh, 19th right around that 2350 mark. So I might be wrong. We'll see how the month ends. Tom says, do a survey asking how 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 housing is doing in your area. Housing is doing quite well uh, despite so so interest rates. Yeah, I think I think housing is doing pretty good. 
um, you know, the, the thing that I, is, I find perplexing is the cost of rents. You know, you looked, we talked about that under the CPI numbers. That's the number one driver is the, the housing cost. Um, they're expensive. I, and I, I'm sure everybody lives in different parts of the world, but you know, you look around here and to find a, you know, a, a two bedroom, one bath place is like 3000 plus uh, a month which if you did it right, that's a mortgage payment. And we can go on that argument of uh, the discussion about what's better to rent or to own. Man, if you can um, get yourself an all-in pity mortgage payment uh, for those on property taxes, insurance, uh, taxes, all that's pity, is uh, an interest. If you can get yourself a mortgage payment with pity all included for 3000 and you're renting it out for $3,500 a month, what are you doing? You know, just that's what you should be doing is renting it out, let someone else pay that mortgage for you, and then you have positive income on top of it. Win-win. Let's see. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, credit lenders can't afford to have financial edu financially educated Americans. It'd be a counterproductive. Exactly why I want to do it, Dave. The more, the longer I'm in this, the more I feel like this whole system is designed to get all of us to spend and do irresponsible things with our money. And if you are smart enough to think that you need to do responsible things with your money, then you need to put it with these people that are way smarter than you. At least that's what they tell you or make you believe, uh, and they can manage your money for you. I, I think that that's a false narrative. We are all smart enough to manage our own money, certainly to start earning yield on the money that we have and, and watch our expenses. So, yeah, the financial industry is a it's a stacked deck. Uh, but marketing people make a lot of money convincing people they need to buy the latest gadgets. Yeah, absolutely. There's no argument there. That's what marketing is. It's convincing and making you believe that you need something. You know, every time I go outside and I see I got a lot of neighbors here and they've most of these people don't switch cars very frequently. Um, I have a, a, a friend, a couple that I know, that seems like every couple of years they have a brand new car. And they're constantly making ridiculous payments on their car. That, that's on them. They're, in my opinion, they're losing. I mean, I haven't made a payment on my car for eight years. And I, I'm not going to make it. I mean, I paid cash for it. And I will never make a payment on those things unless they're paying me 0% or giving me 0% interest. But... I still don't need to buy a new car all the time. My truck is totally fine, and I love it. Inverse head and shoulders pattern on there on gold. Let's check out the old GC chart, and then I'm going to go to my uh, my chart here in a second. Inverse head and shoulder. No, 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 no. I I don't see an inverse head and shoulder. I see just an absolute just breakout. You got a bullish flag, rip to the upside. Um, looks looks fantastic. It actually does feel like it's ready for a pullback. I thought we'd see a pullback here on Monday's chart. You can see that little shooting star we had yesterday on gold futures. Uh, GLD doesn't look much different. Oops. There's your GLD. You know, I don't I don't see an inverse head and shoulders here, no. All right, let me go back to my, my graphics here. So I had the Fed uncertainty, and then uh, I have the market wobble. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about how the trend is your friend. There's no reason to be worried about these markets at this point, and the charts still say that. However, I say wobble, Merely to the fact because we've broken these very, very short-term lows, right? I'll slide this down here, and you can see that we had this low on the S&P 500 that goes back to March 26. We just broke that today. We're still in that kind of upward channel that I have drawn here, right? So um, this does still looks good, but it is showing weakness. This is the first time it's really shown some weakness here. I made a new low for the really the first time since this year where it's broken a recent low and made a new low. So that's the only really weakness I see here on the S&P. But wait, we're not done. NASDAQ. I said our only real concern here is if we start to break down and make new lows. We hit 18,375 today. We did break that red line, which was the low going back to last Wednesday. Again, it's not the end of the world. It's still in that upward trend line. Let me see if I can draw uh, a decent one in here. Ugh, it's not a really great trend line. I'm kind of cutting through points here, but that's the, the torture of technical analysis. You know, if I go through here, you can see we broke down below that today. So I'm starting to see, you know, the graphic here shows the brick wall and kind of a slight breaking through that brick wall. Uh, it's not done. You know, this isn't saying this is the end. It's just, you know, the, the if you're driving a car right now, the yellow light just came on, right? It's saying, hold on, be a little concerned here. We are making... A, a deviation from the trend. It's starting to show some weakness. Not that it's the end, but it may be a turning point. And then, of course, the Russell, the one that I did not hold overnight. Man, what a different day that would be if I held that thing overnight. 
uh, from its high of 21.29 to its low of 20.72. You're looking at uh, 28 plus 29, that's 57, 57 points at 50 points a pop, or 50 points a point. Uh, no, that's a, a considerable game there. It'd be 2,500 bucks per contract night too. Dab nab it. Wouldn't it be nice? Oh, well. On that note, take a peek at that Russell chart, right? The lows that go back to January 14th, really the beginning of this year, is kind of that channel that it is in. And it hasn't broken the major swing low, which to me is this one down here at 2035, but it did break the one from last week and did so convincingly two days in a row. So it does feel like... Um, it's getting a little bit slower, a little bit slower, a little bit slower. At this point here, if you have some significant profits, as many of you probably do on some of your positions, if it was in my account, I would probably move my stop losses up and be prepared to exit those and be okay with that. Because if it does start to roll over, if in fact we see the negative factors, which are increasing oil, increasing yield, uh, keep moving to the upside, then then we may have a bigger problem on our hands. And here here's what's happening today. You can see the 10-year bond was up today as well. Came right to the upper end of that range. Didn't close above it, but boy, this looks like an ascending triangle that is looking to break. And if we get that nice big jump to 4.6 on the 10-year yield, uh, more pains ahead for these equity markets. So something to consider. You know, I'm, I'm not here to be a purveyor of doom and gloom. That's absolutely not what I'm doing. I'm just saying this channel um, is starting to get challenged a little bit. Just a slight weakness. Now, if we get outside this channel and really start to make some new lows, and then it's probably time to close our positions and start looking at maybe even shorting this thing. So holding IIU with the same cost basis as SLV, IIU, four months blowing away my gains on silver four years. Oof. All right. Well, gold, you know, gold at least has had that huge percentage move. Silver has been very choppy, which is why I really enjoyed selling puts against the thing, right? Sell some puts, collect it, sell premium against it. Fine, uh, get my 1% per month, and if I can get even more than that on a little rally up like it has had, then it makes it all worthwhile. But yeah, gold certainly had the bigger breakout because more people are looking for that defensive play. All right, so that was the market wobble. Again, it's not through the wall, but starting to show some little cracks in it. And then finally, AI does not do a good job um, of, of recreating my face. It does a great job of my gray hair and messed up you know, hairstyle. Um, but yeah, there, there's me. I don't know. I guess I needed to shave when I took that picture. But it's Merlin's surrender. All right, what are you talking about? Well, as you guys know, we had GoEV report earnings last night, and I was reading through some of the documentation. And while some of the numbers do look good, right, their loss was certainly way better than expected. The estimate was they were going to lose a buck seventy-seven per share. They only lost a dollar, or sorry, uh, ninety-two cents. So significant improvement over what the expectations were. However, there was some stuff in there. I, you know, I told you when I made this trade that it's about can the stock turn the corner? Does it make it to the finish line, get enough capital infusion that it can make it and now be producing these vehicles? Given the slowdown with the numbers that came out with Tesla today and just kind of my feeling about the economy overall, I decided to close that position out because if the economy struggles, then there's going to be less need for people like NASA, uh, the post office, government offices in Oklahoma, where they're based out of, to buy their vehicles, right? It's just going to be cut back to spending a little bit, and that could hit them directly. So in my opinion, it feels like, <laughs> yeah, no, Tom, I am not the whale in GoEV, but I did dump all my shares. I thought about dumping part of it. Uh, I'll tell you what, I am still interested in GoEV. I'm not, I'm not like poo-pooing them that they're garbage, but it's just, if we do see some economic turmoil ahead, then you know it may not be the wisest choice to deploy my capital in that one. I, I, I hope they succeed. I love the vehicle. I think it's pretty damn cool. Uh, I got out at 280 today, so right pretty much right at the closing price, and it's already down 4% after hours. If this does get back down to that 131, I'll probably take the gains that I have on this one, which are pretty substantial, at least from a rate of return perspective. It was hundred and I think 114% rate of return in, well, I can tell you, I was at really just a very fortunate, lucky trade because I bought it the day before that happened. Um, it shows 89%, but my numbers are showing 114 uh, in 12 days. So, no, nah, I mean, I'll, t I'll take that. 
12 trading sessions. But, yeah, I didn't want to be greedy. Uh, I should have taken some profit earlier on as it came up towards that supply zone right around 490. But it's fine. I'm still happy with the rate of return and the numbers I got. But there you go. That's, uh, that's my surrender on this one. Uh, what else did I do today? Oh, I, I told you about the Tesla ones. I verified my Rivian as well. I thought I sold $10 puts on Rivian. I didn't do that. I, I'm long 1,000 shares of Rivian, and I sold calls uh, on Rivian as well. Let me share that with you. And that, that's why I, I got confused. But I sold uh, calls on Rivian at 11.50, and those were for April 19th. So I'll put that right here, 11.50, right, right about there. And we could get there. My average price on Rivian was 11.30. So even if we got to that, um, uh, it's actually my price was actually less than that. But 11.30 is where I am entered at, and we'll see if we get to the 11.50 mark. Anyway, just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, what else do I have for you? That was the 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 gist of my piece there. We talked about some other parts that I wanted to get to anyway, which was gold, that continuing strength. Um, but I think we we maybe wouldn't. Oh, we didn't talk about Bitcoin. You saw some pretty interesting things. There is a general belief that there is a group or an entity out there that is manipulating Bitcoin and just the way that it's been moving. Like, so there's what makes Bitcoin fascinating is when you have a digital asset, the holders of that asset are visible on a ledger. It's open. You can see exactly what's there. Plus, since they're doing perpetual futures and, and leveraged assets, on these digital blockchains, you can see who's leveraged long or who's leveraged short. And you can see where the liquidation prices are. So what this means is someone with a lot of capital, let's say I've got $100 million sitting there, I can go to some of these exchanges. And let's say Bitcoin's trading, I'm making up the numbers, let's say it's trading at 70,000. And I can see that there is... 50,000 people that are heavily leveraged long trying to ride this momentum to the upside. All I have to do is do a big sell order, push the price of Bitcoin down because a sudden influx of my Bitcoin or, or whatever will push that price down. It liquidates those longs, which means they now are forced to sell, which collapses price even further. And as it drops significantly, it creates a buying opportunity for me with another portion of money, um, basically manipulating the market. And unfortunately, that's still, that is a very real plausible scenario. You can see how quickly this stuff fell late last night. Uh, we were up around $70,000 and in a period of, uh, that's at 7 p.m. By 7.35, we had hit a low of $66,500. That's, that's a $3,500 drop in uh, just a few minutes. So pretty significant. And it's, it really goes back to people manipulating the market. At least Lisa says Sailor. Uh, I don't think Sailor's selling for anything. I think Sailor is, you want to talk about the true meaning of diamond hands? It's Michael Sailor. He's not selling for anything. Um, I think he will keep that going on and on and on. Dave says, it sounds like an algorithm used in all the markets. Yeah. The, the difference is, again, Dave, and for everybody that understands traditional markets like stocks or, or futures, is those are centralized. So to move that market is much harder because you have all this centralized liquidity. But if I go to, let's say, KuCoin, which has a certain amount of customers, but it doesn't represent the whole, if I hammer that exchange and cause that one to crash, it creates panic on all the others because there's algorithms that are linked up there. So yeah, it definitely is... Uh, it, it, it's something you got to be tough with in the crypto world. I don't mind. Like, I really, I just, I don't mind because I know I'm holding it for at least another year. So move up, move down. I don't care. All in all, I think we'll see it end up moving to the upside. Uh, and of course, we're going to have the halving here coming soon, which is a totally different ballgame. All right. Let me look at your economic calendar for tomorrow. I'll tell you what we got cooking. Let me undo all my filters here since I uh, had quite a few on there. We'll go to Wednesday's session. For the U.S., as you can see, some red factories on here. It gets back to the jobs data. You have the ADP non-farm employment change. They're expecting more job creation. That's a good sign. Of course, don't forget, we have the unemployment rate on Friday. You also have several FOMC members. You've got Bostic. You've got Bowman. You've got Fed Chair Powell, Barr, and Kugler speaking. So you have a lot of members speaking. Uh, Powell's meeting is actually going to be at Stanford. That's at 1210. Uh, let's see. Am I on Eastern time? Yeah, I think this is Eastern time. Yeah, 1210 Eastern Time. It's a little afternoon. Uh, Jerome Powell will be speaking at the Stanford, what's it called? The Business, uh, Government, and Society Forum. Now, I don't expect him to say anything out of the ordinary. Why would he? He's already said enough. 
but you never know uh, what might come out of his mouth. You also have crude oil inventories and ISM services PMI for the U.S. You have final services PMI, which is manufacturing um, index services, purchasing managers index. There we go. Do not Bitcoin ETFs help to avoid price manipulation? Yes, they do to some extent. Um, but because there's only 21 million of these things, and right now there's probably really about 15 million that are tradable, and out of that, only a small handful are on exchanges, the potential to manipulate is astronomically high, to have huge swings and fluctuations. You know, this is a uniqueness to Bitcoin that I've never seen in anything in my entire trading career, and it's maybe a first for many of you, is most of the products and most of the companies that you see were brought to market by big businesses. Right? They were brought to market by Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. They found these companies, they bought into them, they brought them public, they marketed those companies and made you believe like they were the greatest thing ever and you gotta buy it. Crypto is the only thing I've ever seen that was started all because of retail traders, not one institution involved. It was all people, humans like you and me going, hey, this is an interesting idea. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we're seeing that point where institutions are getting into it. So. I think we have to embrace the uh, institutional shenanigans that typically get, typically get played and just know what those games are. And if you are you know, a short-term day trader, man, there's some phenomenal opportunities out here, but you're kind of at the whims of the big fish. If you're like me and a hodler of it, I don't really care. You know, I, I'm not really that worried about it at all. Agent Sanchez, are we bears or bulls this month? Um, Agent Sancho, that's a very open-ended question. If you narrow it down, if you say stock market, I am, I got to say I'm slightly bearish. I, I think you're going to start to see things slightly roll over. I am still bullish on commodities. I'm still bullish on Bitcoin um, and, and cryptocurrency as a whole, even though we had a pretty wicked last 24 hours. Uh, but it really depends on what market you're talking about. Yeah, you can be bullish and bearish on multiple sectors at the exact same moment in time. Okay, that's going to do it for me. I am um, not going to do an hour show. Sorry, Big Ab, can't do it. If you uh, want something covered on tomorrow's show, email me, tradermerlin at gmail.com or put them down below any of the YouTube videos. Uh, and those who did put their comments down, I appreciate that. Thank you for um, you know, commenting on the videos or asking me things there. It's always nice to see different uh, questions brought up on, uh, on my YouTube channel. Let me see real quick. I had some, I thought one came through. Um, yeah, you guys were, were helping me fix that audio yesterday. Oof, man. Um, John, um, let me just get this one from John. John says the Bitcoin mining fees per block are higher than the block reward. That's that's actually not true. Um, there was a couple of instances where the, remember you have two ways you can earn money as a miner, right? When you mine a block of Bitcoin, you get the 6.25 Bitcoin. That's your guarantee. But you also get the fees that were paid. Now ordinals or inscriptions on Bitcoin have caused serious demand for the network. And there was one point for a very short window of time where the fees collected per block were bigger than 6.25. So you're getting monsters. Now it's much lower than that. For those of you who would like to know how to see that, let me show you. And then I'll wrap this one up. But I want to make sure I got to the viewer question out here. So since this is a blockchain explorer, you should, um, you can go to something like Bitcoin, btc.com, and you can click on Explorer up here. And it will show you all the recent transactions for Bitcoin. You can see all the different various data, right? So you can see all the mining pools and who's been doing the most. Uh, let me go here and click on Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Here's the Bitcoin Explorer. And I'll scroll down here to the most recent block. You can see the latest block. So Spider Pool right here is the group that mined this last block. And you can see the reward here. It's so 6.39. Remember, 6.25 of that is the fees. Or sorry, is the mining reward. So we go here and you can see that the fees were only 0.14 Bitcoin on the side. That's the reward, the fees. But when, um, when ordinals first came out, these fees were like six, seven Bitcoin. It was crazy. Uh, and I thought we'd see miners really have a big uh, growth in their earnings because they were just basically doubling their rate of return for pretty much nothing. So that's, um, that's your current reward is pretty small for Bitcoin. The fee reward, the block reward stays the same at 6.25. Remember, when we get to block 840,000, right now it's 837,448. When we get to block 840,000, that next block, this will turn to 3.125. And those miners will now be making half of what they made before. And we'll see if that impacts your bottom line. I am still up in the air on how that's all going to work. Uh, let's see. Have you ever considered a two hour long roundtable session? I have some thoughts. I have, um, you know, 
every day, guys, or every day, Dave, I go through a, a an inner dialogue of I, I need to be. I should take this time that I'm spending here and put it towards something where I'm actually generating an income from it and and making some money off of it. So, you know, to do a two hour show, probably not going to happen unless there's some income behind it. Um, you know, I enjoy doing this, but doing it, like I say, free for. Um, going on what, 2020 is when I started doing this for free so I'm going on four years of doing this show free uh, every day pretty big commitment doing an hour two hours would be a bit of a stretch but maybe I can do some special shows with other people in the future I wanted to get um, a bunch of people together for Don or for um, Bob Dunn but I just couldn't pull that off and get it together so maybe maybe someday Dave you can email me let me know what your thoughts are tradermerl at gmail.com all right, everybody, that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for your participation. I appreciate it. Hope you learned something as usual, and I will see you all tomorrow. Take care.